In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. It has been a difficult week for our community. We've lost three members of Emmanuel. One, a long ago parishioner, was J. Warren Cotty. Warren and his wife Patricia were married here in this parish 71 years ago. Another longtime parishioner that we've lost was Pat Boutro. She was a beloved member of the Altar Guild, among other things. And finally, as hopefully most of you know by now, we lost Hugo Harrison, a longtime parishioner and club member at Horizon House, who had formed many friendships here at Emmanuel. I know that many of us are grieving Hugo's sudden and unexpected death. We will pray for all of this soon, but I wanted to put it out there and acknowledge that there is grief in losing three parishioners in the same week. The Gospel lesson in Luke this morning assures us that as we grieve, we are blessed by God. We are never alone. The passage in Luke is often titled, The Sermon on the Plain. It is perhaps a little less known than Matthew's version of the Beatitudes, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. They are similar words, as I said, that are found in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, I've been to that mount in Israel where this scene presumably took place, and I can tell you, it's not much of a mount. It's really more of a hill. Placing this sermon in the context of a plain rather than a mount is significant, though, for a plain implies a level playing ground. Jesus spoke to the crowd, not by looking down on them, but by meeting them face to face. And we know that many in this great multitude of people that came to hear him were not used to that kind of respect. Jesus spoke to assure them that those on the fringe of society could be healed by him and were especially blessed by God. Blessed are you who are poor, who are hungry, who weep, and who are reviled and hated. Transformative words that could change the lives of those people who were used to being scorned or ignored. But while Jesus wanted everyone in the crowd to hear this message, he is also directing this in a very way to his disciples as he wanted these truths about God's kingdom to transform them and the way they do the, their ministry, the way in which they follow him. He looked right at them, we are told, to emphasize the importance of what he had to say. Four blessings and four woes or warnings. Woe to you who have the riches of life, who don't struggle with hunger or sorrow, or lack of respect in society. Woe to you who rest on your laurels and ignore the needs of the rest of the world. There are many different ways, of course, to interpret this passage. Some take a more severe tone than others. In order to be a real Christian, you should give up all of your material things and devote your life to serving the people that are struggling. Some Christians do this, and it is admirable. But most of us live somewhere in the middle of wanting to be comfortable and also wanting to help the poor, the hungry, the grieving, and the hated. Simply put, another way to interpret these words by Jesus is to think of priorities. If you are living a comfortable life with enough of what you need, do you leave it at that? Or do you make a point to share it? so that others can also have at least enough. For example, I'm always astounded by the fact that there is more than enough food in the world to feed everyone. And yet, millions go hungry because for many, many socio-political reasons, the food isn't distributed fairly. Now, when we bring in cans of soup or cereal, and put it in the box for the Wakefield Food Pantry. And when we provide a monthly meal to people who are unhoused through Bread of Life, 
we are taking steps to share our resources with those who don't have. If we have enough food ourselves, then it's not only just a kind thing to do, but it's our duty to think about those who don't. When we comfort those who are grieving by visiting, bringing them meals, taking extra time to help them with their errands, we are being disciples of Christ. This is a parish who is generous in mission and in pastoral care, and I know that it's not necessary to be preaching to the choir. We do share our time, our talents, and our resources. So perhaps the way that this gospel message can transform us this morning is to continue our quest for understanding the causes of the disparities in the world. Why is there such a wide gap in the haves and have nots, including right here in the United States? Now we embarked on a deep dive into this in 2020 after the shooting of George Floyd in Minnesota. As you know, we've had book discussions, guest speakers, sermons, evening programs on, on Zoom to look at the issue of racism and how that impacts all of us. We join many other parishes in our diocese around the country who are doing the exact same thing. February is Black History Month, and it's a good time to remember that we must keep up with this work, the work of understanding so that we can be even better disciples of Christ. Understanding why there are groups of Americans who haven't had the same access to education or health care or fair housing, who haven't had economic opportunities that would lift them out of poverty. Understanding the history of black Americans in our country and how the past really does influence the present. Now we're gonna to continue to do this through offering more opportunities to look at these issues, particularly through an Episcopal Church film and reading dialogue-based series on race that is grounded in faith. Many parishes all over the country have been participating in this 10-week session series called Sacred Ground, and we will do this in partnership with parishioners and clergy at the Church of the Good Shepherd in Reading. I've had the chance to view all of the films and read all of the accompanying book chapters and articles and find this to be an excellent program. And I hope that as many of you as possible would consider participating in when it's offered, most likely in the late winter or early spring. Sacred Ground is not just about studying Black American history, we'll also explore other Americans who have faced discrimination, who are on the edges, so to speak, on the fringes of society. I love this quote about sacred ground that is on their website. Sacred ground holds us as a guiding star of the vision of beloved community, where all people are honored and protected and nurtured as beloved children of God, where we weep at one another's pain and seek one another's flourishing. A beloved community is a world where people are seen and treated as equals. A world where people believe that the truth, the truth that God has provided enough, enough food, enough medicine, enough wisdom, enough knowledge to love and address all of the needs of God's world. Raising up people who are oppressed does not make those of us who have more have less. That has been proven time and time again. Restoring justice to God's world raises up all of God's people, you, me, and all of our neighbors. And I think that hits the nail on the head today with God, today's gospel 